is that our hearts and minds that we come into this place and this space to worship Almighty God. If Christ is in you, then the Spirit is your life. Choir will now sing to us and we are recording the intro that we are here to praise you.
Please be seated. Now that we're back to standing to sing, we'll stay seated during our prayer. Let's come before God. Father, we come before you this morning in this place and this space to worship you, but to worship you with thankfulness that for the first time in 18 months we are able to use our voices to sing your praise. And we are thankful for the opportunity to also gather in this place and in this space to celebrate, to celebrate around the Lord's table, sharing communion in unusual ways, but nonetheless real. So Father, be with us in our worship. Help us to be thankful for all the good things that we have in our lives. Thank you for the opportunities we have to get back to a semblance of normality as we worship you. So by your Spirit, move amongst us this morning. Help us to know your presence. Draw us closer to you and to one another. We would confess, O oh Lord, it's not been easy. And at times we might have been discouraged from keeping on, keeping on with the faith. But we are keeping the faith. And we know that you will forgive us for all our sins and transgressions no matter what form that they may take. So as we confess all our sins, as we seek your forgiveness, we ask that by the same Holy Spirit of whom we have spoken, we will allow that forgiveness in. We will recognise that we are set free in Christ and that we can go forth not in our own self-righteousness, but in the righteousness that is given to us through Jesus Christ. Help us to be your people, to live our lives as you would have us live them, and to give glory to you, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, ever to be praised. Amen. Amen. And with the theme of church togetherness uh, and being one in worship, uh, we now share in our praise as we listen to Angus and Andrea bring to us a worship song. Hallelujah, 
and the rest of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Amen. Amen indeed, and thanks, Myra, and thanks be to God for that reading from the Old Testament. The Gospel reading this morning is from Mark 3, and we're looking at the verses 20 to 35. Mark 3, 20 to 35. Let's hear, read together, let's hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. And the teachers of law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all the sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying that he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, and standing outside they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here? are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Amen and thanks be to God for both of these readings from his word and to his name be the glory, the honour and the praise. Let's have our short prayer. Lord, be in our hearing, but also in our listening. Lord, be in our minds, but also in our understanding. Lord, be in our hearts, and in our doing the things that you would have us do in the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Now, if I was to ask you what uh, last week's sermon were, was, uh, I wonder just how many would remember. So let me help you. Last Sunday, uh, the reading that we looked at finished rather dramatically. It finished with these words. The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. You see, the heat was on and the angrier these people got 
uh, the Pharisees, the more Jesus appeared to be growing in popularity, he was so, so busy healing, casting out demons, and gathering together his disciples. But nonetheless, there were so many people in pursuit of this controversial yet winsome rabbi. So here's a question to consider as we think of this morning's passage. Who is Jesus to you? Because even Jesus' blood relatives as he conducted his ministry began to think that he was mad and his detractors accused him of being demon-possessed. We read there, didn't we, that the teachers of the law said he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. That's how he can drive out demons. Yet Jesus wasn't slow to defend himself, showing that basically those who didn't like what he had to say, his detractors, were speaking a load of nonsense. It might seem ridiculous to us, as his followers today, that anyone could think of Jesus as anything other than good. Even some of Christianity's business big, biggest critics these days would confess or admit to Jesus being a good man. I watched uh, some time ago uh, a YouTube clip of an event that had taken place south of the border where Stephen Fry and some other atheists like him were taken on the Roman Catholic Church. The debate was interesting. <coughs> Anne Whitcomb was on the side of the church along with some others and Stephen Fry and others were against the church. And it was a robust debate because the question that was been asked was, has the church done good for anyone? I'd recommend that you go and look at it. It's challenging, but it's also stimulating. But in the midst of that, though there were scathing attacks made on the Roman Catholic Church for all its failures, Stephen Fry couldn't bring himself to say that Jesus was anything other than a good man. In fact, he went on to say if the church lived out its life as Jesus did, it may well be a force for good. So that was coming from an atheist. So it's hard to believe that anyone would think ill of the Lord Jesus Christ. But people do. So while some atheists might say that Jesus was a good man, others in his own time were saying that he wasn't so good, that what he was doing was somehow evil. It was at the hands of Beelzebub or the devil. So on this highly charged spiritual question, <coughs> using stories as he normally did or parables, Jesus calmly and logically said, what a ridiculous proposition that was. He talks about how can a house be divided against itself because what Jesus was doing was contrary to evil. And he says even to plunder a strong man's house, the strong man would have to be bound up and overcome before you could do the deed of emptying his house. The strong man, of course, being an image of the devil itself. So Jesus was saying, what a ridiculous proposition it is that he was doing anything other than the will of God. <coughs> demonstrating that what he did was contrary to the service of the devil. In fact, even at this early stage in his ministry, 
something was being revealed about Jesus that others had difficulty getting a hold of. And what was that? Not only was he good, but he was God. And if we look closely at the passage before this this morning, we see how Trinitarian it is too. Jesus issues a very serious warning to his detractors to speak the way that they were speaking about him was in effect blasphemy because to speak against him was to speak against the Holy Spirit which was in turn to speak against God. In fact the exact words were whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness but is guilty of eternal sin. Don't know about you, but I find that a very frightening statement and the most terrifying statement ever uttered by Jesus. And like many others, as a young Christian, I was afraid and terrified that I might commit the unforgivable sin without even knowing it. But of course, Jesus said that all sin is forgivable. All sin is forgivable. Except one sin. And that is to sin against the Holy Spirit. Which is impossible for a Christian. And why? Because as a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within us and intercedes on behalf, our behalf. And so if a sin of, against the Holy Spirit takes place, then that person was never a Christian in the first place. Commentator sums it up like this, for the sin in question is to have such high levels of unbelief in Jesus and the Holy Spirit as to say persistently, continuously, and without interruption, that God and God's works are evil. And so, clearly what Jesus was saying to some of these Pharisees was, be careful what you're saying, think about what you're believing to God, because to Accuse Jesus and then God of being evil <coughs> was in fact, if it persisted, the un, one and only unforgivable sin. And that, my friends, was the trap that these retractors were in danger of falling into. So if these scribes from Jerusalem were to continue to say such things about Jesus, that would be sin against the Spirit, and therefore sin against God, because Jesus was God at work. So there is one sin that's unforgivable and that's to continuously say that God is not good. Let's take you back for a moment to how frenetic all this works. You know you can imagine the crowds that was around Jesus following him desperately looking for answers. So frenetic and so busy that Jesus, we're told, didn't even have a chance to eat. And there was his family outside, concerned about all this commotion and, and saying that, I think he's gone mad. And the scribes and the Pharisees making very dangerous comments in contrast. In contrast, he was calm, logical, and controlled. 
when his family came to call him out from the crowd, almost in a humorous fashion, you can imagine mother out there saying, Jesus, you get out here this minute. He did what he often does. He takes exactly what's happening, the scene that's unfolding, looks around at others and uses it to make a point and to teach a lesson. And so as people are saying, hey, your family's out there asking for you, Jesus asks a question. Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Here is my mother. Here are my brothers. Here is my sister. You, you, and you. Whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, my sister, is part of my family, is part of the family of God. I read to us from the Old Testament in 1 Samuel about the folly of Israel in the time of Samuel, where through their lack of faith in God, they wanted to be ruled instead by a king. They wanted a king because all the other nations around them had a king. What they were failing to recognise was that God was sufficient to look after them. God was sufficient in meeting their desires. But in terms of that thinking and their desires, they were led into a kind of idolatry. A kind of idolatry that Samuel was trying to warn them against. That if they chose to be subject to a human king rather than God their king, then there was likely to be nothing but trouble. More and more demands made upon them by the king and by the list of them. Freedoms disappearing as more was asked of them as subjects. With God alone, they didn't have to worry about any of that. But if they were wanting a king, then it was laid before them the dangers of going down that road. Something that illustrates well for us if they can't see Jesus for who he is, then we're likely to be in trouble. You see, in the passage from our New Testament reading in Mark, we see in this encounter possibility of two groups or types of people and who can look to Jesus and come to two entirely different conclusions. One group looks to Jesus and sees the Son of God. Another looks to Jesus and is so threatened by what he teaches that they risk falling into idolatry or even worse than that fall into the eternal sin that cannot be forgiven you see this little passage this little domestic scene where Jesus' family are calling him out and he's saying my family are much bigger than this this passage invites us to encounter the calm, logical Son of God who seeks to embrace us as mother, brother, sister and member of the Holy Family of God. So maybe we should think seriously about who is Jesus to each of us. Because the call from this passage 
is that rather than being disturbed by his presence as the Pharisees were, we are expected to feel very much at home in his country, company. What an appropriate notion as we gather round his table to share communion with one another and to hear once again that we are Jesus' mother, brother and sister. Amen and thanks be to God for that preaching from his word and to his name be all the glory, the honour and the praise. Just a wee note uh, before we start, uh, and that's him. Jackie's going to bring the offering in since it's now a plate. We'll bring the offering in. And as we sing one bread, one body, I'll sing the chorus part, which is at the beginning, uh, and then the congregation, you'll sing by responding by singing the verse. So I'll sing one bread, one body, and so on, and then you'll come in for each verse. So, I was going to give us a, a two minute tune as Jackie uh, brings in the collection. <laughs>
with the question in our minds, who is Jesus to me? We come here around the Lord's table, recognising that Jesus invites all who love him to share the fellowship that's shared side by this bread and this wine. But in the action of communion, we declare that we belong to Christ and we also belong to one another. Jesus prayed for the disciples before his arrest, saying, Keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. So we're called to remember our own hearts. In the words of Paul when he says, so let everyone examine himself first and then eat the bread and drink from the cup. The Lord's Supper is about being one in Christ, about being at peace with each other. Unfortunately, we can't share the sign of peace unless you're in a bubble, if you've got your partner with you or a friend or whatever, then feel free to shake their hand. But what we can do is we can say to one another, the peace of God be with you. So let's say that together. The peace, peace of God, God be with you. Hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they are recorded by Paul. I receive from the Lord what I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For so as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the following example, we take bread and the cup and we give thanks. So maybe now is the opportunity for you to get three bits and pieces organised as we come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lift up your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord. Almighty God, we praise you for the wonder of the world that you intended for good. And we thank you for your fatherly guidance in our lives and in the lives of all your children. Because your family, above all, we thank you that through your Son, our sins are forgiven. By the sacrifice on the cross, he has taken away all that separates us from you. By your Holy Spirit, cleanse us from our sins and lift the veil from our eyes that through this bread and this wine we will see the grace of our God revealed in Jesus Christ. Father, we have brought with us this morning our own bread and our own wine. But wherever it comes from, it is here in one place. And so as we take the bread and the wine, we ask your blessing upon these ordinary elements, that they are being put to an extraordinary use as we remember all that you have done for us. Um, so during his earthly life, we know that Jesus shared meals with his friends, just as we share meals with our friends. And at the Last Supper, he broke bread and poured wine as a sign of his sacrifice, telling his disciples to follow his example and to do likewise. We are also his followers. 
And so we are called to do likewise at his invitation and command. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let us take first the bread and then the wine as we remember Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. Thank you. 
participation. So let's stand and we'll read together uh, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father and Lord, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God,
just before the blessing, two things. Uh, there is tea and coffee after the service, so it's been a long time, so please take the opportunity to hang back in your bubbles in a well-spaced hall for a wee cup of tea and coffee. And you'll see as you go out, there are some goods uh, that we would rather use than put in the bin, so feel free to take uh, whatever uh, you would like. Rather appropriately, there's quite a number of bed, pro uh, bed products uh, there, so uh, please take it before it goes stale or goes in the bin. And now, go forth in peace and keep alive the faith. And may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and forevermore.